Welcome. This is the first of a two-part series on contentment. Um, I originally did the outline that you'll see today in 2002, but there was no audio or video on it, and people had asked me to um, rectify that situation. And I'd done another one in 2009 um, on initiated it into the secret mysteries of contentment, uh, which has some similar content, but a little different emphasis. Uh, back in 2002, um, the world was not in great shape. Um, like 40% of teenagers uh, were, were having sex, uh, using alcohol and drugs, and uh, a smaller proportion were considering suicide. Uh, since then, in a 2000 21 survey of uh, over 17,000 high school junior seniors. Um, the alcohol use and sex ac sexual activity and drug use had actually all declined. But what I found truly alarming uh, when I heard about this, I looked it up, the amount of particularly girls who were considering suicide, um, which is over 30 percent. Uh, the figure I heard from the newscaster was like almost 40 percent. Um, so I found the Center for Disease Control Statistics, which actually are usually uh, have some political bias in them, but you can go look over it yourself and uh, see that 42 percent of uh, these teens uh, had experienced incapacitating and persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness, a huge increase. Um, they defined it as experiencing every day for at least two weeks uh, such sadness or hopelessness that you couldn't function. And people go through you know, most of their year uh, with that. Uh, then they went down a little deeper. 57% of the girls uh, probably what, 16, 17 years old, experienced this. 70% of LGBTQ plus um, and 78% of people who uh, had the same sex partner. So I don't know if we could call them homosexual, gays probably included in here, but that's just the way they gave the statistics, uh, experienced these feelings. As a result of this loneliness sadness, hopelessness, 22% uh, of them considered seriously attempting suicide. But 30% of the girls, 45% of uh, uh, the LG, LGBTQ population, and 58% of the same-sex folks. Uh, this last characteristic tends to be the highest in just about every category. Uh, people are confused about their gender, uh, confused about morality, uh, clearly are not exposed to biblical teaching nor consider it valid, and life has gotten to the point where they want to end it. Majority of people in this last category. 18% uh, had actually made a plan to do it. 24% of those were girls. Uh, guys were significantly less, but uh, the other two categories match up like this, 37 to 50. Uh, and 29% overall as a group, uh, by various assessments, uh, the study didn't detail them, <clears throat> uh, considered themselves to have poor mental health. Uh, this inability to sleep, uh, focus, concentrate, much of that, according to other studies, like Yale has a study out, you can find it, you just Google search effect of uh, social media on teens, um, they, they, they can't function. Uh, if you're spending more than three hours a day on social media, uh, you, you run into all these problems that really make you ill-equipped ill for life, which is going to add to the sadness and hopelessness thing. And social media is basically, for folks, escapism. I think the reason the guys uh, aren't as high on uh, these numbers is they tend to play more video games. Oh, the other thing that was actually I found uh, really interesting was that on every single uh, sex and drug 
category, the women uh, had a higher percentage of folks uh, than guys that were experiencing negative side effects from this. So I entitled it a sermon that I'm not going to do today, and I'm not sure if I'll do it in the future, but this is a crisis. Uh, when people start killing themselves, uh, folks tend to think, yeah, maybe, maybe there's a problem here. Maybe something's not right. Um, and really the thing's not right is their thinking, their perspective on life. And I would submit to you that probably the majority of Christians are discontent with various aspects of their life. <laughs> and sinfully so. We'll get to that on the screen coming up. So uh, the verse that's uh, kind of key on this is found in Philippians 4 that Paul said, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. <clears throat> you know, it's easy to be content when everything's going the way, what, the way you like, um, but when things don't go the way you like, particularly in this current generation, they haven't been ter taught self-control, they haven't been taught resilience, they haven't been taught, uh, because they haven't been given the opportunities to uh, bounce back from difficulties because of helicopter parents and other things like that. And Paul says this, I'm not saying this in because I'm in need. So he's writing a letter to the Philippians. The uh, whole thing is a thank you letter for his support. Read about that on Daily Truth Base if it's a new concept for you. Most people miss the context of the book <clears throat> and wind up misquoting and misapplying it. Uh, but he said to the Philippians, uh, you know, this, it's not saying this because I have need, it's basically for your benefit uh, to, to be able to renew your support for him. Um, he, he doesn't have need because he's learned to be content uh, even in times of need. I know what it's like to be in need, says Paul. Uh, I too, by the sovereignty of God, have experienced uh, some pretty dire sense of needs. Uh, I had food, sort of, and clothing. And uh, that was it. There are times I did not have a place to sleep. I didn't know where uh, my next dollar uh, was coming from. But I knew, particularly in those more dire circumstances, that God knew and had a plan for me. But we'll maybe elaborate on that later. So he also knows what it's like to have plenty. And even for people who have plenty. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller, a billionaire at the time, was asked... Uh, you know, how much does it take to be content? And he says, just a little more. And uh, I'm, I'm just amazed at how uh, you know, corporate titans at the top of their game have everything, yet they are still driven to go for more. And uh, part of that is because their worth and value is tied up in the wrong things. <clears throat> I've learned to be content. I've learned the secret. And in my follow-up sermon that you'll hear next week... <clears throat> Um, I talk about being initiated into the secret of being content in every and any situation, whatever the circumstances, as he said in the previous verse. And he gives some, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, and there are times he was well-fed and times he was hungry, whether he had plenty or he had want, lack, need. And he can do it all through his relationship with Christ, who is the one who strengthens him, who gives him the endurance, who gives him the resilience. Lots of stuff is going on about the lack of resilience in the current generation. I'm not even sure if they're called millennials. <clears throat> Whatever the post-millennial one is. <clears throat> Gen Z? I don't know. Um, but, you know, we have that ability for us as well to be resilient, to endure, and to do it joyfully. We're going to see that getting your prayers, that I mean a lot to you, denied, or you get an answer that's no, um, is actually a cause for rejoicing. <clears throat> so let's look at this little word for contentment. Uh, it's two Greek words, first meaning self, and the second one meaning strength, sufficient, enough. Um, so being self-sufficient, Christ-sufficient. Um, that in part was my goal in life, to be self-sufficient, um, I'm driven for competency and things. Um, so Paul had a problem with his eyes. Three times he asked the Lord <coughs> to take this thorn out of his flesh. And Christ said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. 
because my strength, says Jesus, is made perfect in weakness. Important verse, grace is parallel to strength and shows up in the next verse as power. Most people forget that grace is the coin of the realm of heaven. Actually, most people don't even know that, but there's a sermon on grace as being that. <clears throat> and it enables you to transact business in the um, spiritual realm. And it's given to us. We can squander it, lose it, abuse it, um, or we can actually invest it and gain it. So we have even more. Uh, there's a sermon on that. If you just want to look at it, sufficient praising grace, the coin of the realm of heaven. So, therefore, I will most gladly, most gladly, Boast, glory in my infirmities, my lack of answered prayer, so that when I am weak, I am strong in Christ. The power of Christ may rest and abide on me. When writing to Timothy, he mentioned that godliness, knowing and doing all that God wants, it, with contentment, is a great gain. You get blessed uh, in the future, and you can just... Uh, be co copacetic, uh, at peace with the present. Having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. And there are times I looked at that in my life and I thought, okay, God has arranged my circumstances, and even though I'm partially responsible for my stupidity <laughs> being in the situation I'm in, uh, in following God, He has allowed these things to happen to me. And uh, he knows what's best. You know, he's good. I don't believe Satan's lie that he's not good. So, Hebrews 3, 13, 15. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Now, that's like one of the uh, few commandments it's like, that is purely internal. Uh, most of them have what you do in relation to others. This is what you do with relation to, to yourself. Uh, covetousness is idolatry. And uh, wanting to desire stuff. Greed is idolatry. Sorry, yeah, covetousness is how it's translated. Uh, this is where you can look up the word that's up here. Okay. Be content with such things as you have. You don't have to be totally content with the situation, but uh, the things, yes, and we're going to see in the next, there's things you can change, but if there's something that we absolutely need, do God's will, he provides it. Huh, yeah, all right. But here, we can be content where we are because he himself, that's the Lord Jesus, has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The problem is we aren't aware of God's presence. We don't seek his face. Uh, we blame him for our problems. And uh, we turn our back on him. Uh, this is true of you, all those who don't have quiet times, um, spending time with God every morning. Uh, you're not doing that. Uh, you're not aware of him. Easton's Bible Dictionary, exactly the concise one you can find in the online Bible where I got it, <coughs> has this previous century almost, uh, so it's uh, a little wordy, but it's actually really good. Contentment is a state of mind. It's even in a prison cell, even being unjustly beaten uh, in a Philippian jail. It's a state of mind in which your desires are confined to your lot, whatever it might be. And lot is not backyard, <laughs> but it's the situation that you find yourself in. And you don't desire to be moved out of there unless God wants you out of there, and you can ask, it's okay. Uh, we'll talk about how you change things in the upcoming Roman numeral. Uh, contentment is opposed to envy. This is why social media causes such depression, because we see everybody putting their best foot forward. Uh, you, know, you don't post pictures of yourself uh, when you just wake up, or if you're a guy when you don't have makeup on, I guess if you're a guy without makeup. Uh, you, you don't post photos when you just found out you didn't get what you want or you got dumped by someone. Uh, you don't post photos of yourself 
you know, sitting alone with tears streaming down your face because somebody did something really nasty to you. Uh, but you always present yourself as if you are doing phenomenal. Um, you know, how are you doing? Um, excellent. Um, is the common answer now. Avarice is greed. Ambition. Oh, peoples. Yeah, ambition. Is this Satan's trick to get you focused on all the wrong things. And then when you don't get them, he then starts stoking the flames of anxiety. And then we got a word we don't use often, repining. And that's kind of a sense of remorse and unhappiness because you can't have what you want. It's, no, it's normally like, I came across the word you know, in uh, more Victorian things about someone repining for someone else that uh, they couldn't have or they thought would be the perfect fulfillment to all their dreams and life. Contentment arises from the inward disposition. So it's what goes on in your, in, in your uh, value stream inside. And it's the offspring of humility. Humility is not my will, but thine be done. It's submission to God. It's, I, you don't need to be better than anyone else or have more than anyone else or have more than you currently have. Uh, you can be content with it and uh, seek it according to God's will and ways. But it also is a product of an intelligent consideration of the rectitude and benignity of divine providence. Okay, rectitude which we get our words straight from. All right? You intelligently consider that God's way is right. And benignity, it's also beneficent, good, kind, beneficial for me. That's the root of all these words. We need to intelligently consider. When do you do that, people? When in your life can you point to yourself doing that? Where in your week? Count your blessings. Um, in our church, we have people share praises, and I'm sure most people think through their weeks thinking about, okay, you know, what do I want to praise God for? Um, you know, how, how has he blessed me? What has he taught me? To share more sometimes in edification times, sometimes in praise times. Um, how has he been good to me? How has he made it well with my soul, even in the midst of some difficulties? But you also need to consider the greatness of the divine promises our own unworthiness. So I'm not a huge fan of warm theology, but by and large, we are not worthy of the blessing God has given us. Um, we need to pray that we have to be counted worthy to escape upcoming tri tribulation. Uh, worthiness is a function of our spiritual discipline and striving, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, 9, to win. As well as from the view of intelligent consideration of all this stuff, that the gospel opens up to us of the rest and the peace hereafter. You know, some people have to get every penny off the table. Um, you know, it's okay to leave benefits for someone else. The ancient uh, Israelites used to, good ones, used to leave uh, the corners of their field unpicked so the poor could come, it's like work fair, and pick the grain for themselves. Uh, the story of Ruth and Boaz uh, emphasizes that. But the gospel fully understood, it's not that Jesus died for your sins, but that he's coming back to reward and bless and rule and judge. Uh, the, the rest that we God has planned for us, make every effort to enter that rest. Uh, it's not talking about the here and now, it is talking about your future reward, Hebrews 4. Check it out on Daily Truth Base because a lot of preachers totally mess that one up. And peace. Uh, peace is a covenantal blessing. So when Paul says grace and peace to people at the beginning of his letters, he's not saying, how you doing? You know, it, it, it's, he's wishing them uh, power, grace in the future. Uh, getting the reward is an act of grace. And peace, Phineas. Spears the copulating couple, and uh, God promises him, it makes a covenant of peace with him as a result. It's a reward. So, the, 
you, you start contemplating these things and you realize you know, God knows what he's doing and will take care of things in the future. If I am cheated out of something or betrayed here, God will make it up to me definitely in the future. And I've found for my life that frequently he makes it up to me in my present life as well, once I get my head in the right spot. So I'll add to Easton's definition, in the present day also, we can get rest and peace. Uh, Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Uh, make your request made known to God. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And if you do the stuff you're supposed to do, the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace, God who gives peace, the God who's our source of peace, it comes from him, will be actually with us. Jesus promises the disciples in the world you'll have tribulation, but in him, in close union with him, you may have peace. Uh, probably the biggest error that I see theologians and preachers and commentators making is they equate in Christ with being, uh, having an abiding John 15 relationship with him. As a, and they say that means, it, that's what it means in scripture, but in most of your teaching it means you're Christian. No, no. In your union with himself, Jesus told his disciples, you will have peace. If you're making disciples, Matthew 28, I will never leave you or forsake you. Uh, there's this little plaque you might see, it has a poem on it about uh, walking along the seashore and you see two sets of footprints and then there's only one set of footprints and the person said, oh Lord, why did you forsake me during those times when life was so difficult? And the Lord said, yeah, keep your shirt on. Those are the times I had to carry you. Of course, he said it much more kindly. But, uh, you know, it's like we we think that he's not there, but he is omniscient. He's always there. He's waiting to help. He's waiting on high to be gracious to you. As is in the Old Testament, it says the Lord waits to be gracious to you. Uh, his eyes run to and fro throughout the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart are perfect towards him. Problem is, our hearts are not perfect towards him, so we can't have confidence in the fact that everything's going to turn out well. Okay, things about which we are bum, 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 sinfully discontent. Being discontent is a sin. It says God's not good and doesn't love me. It's like the two-year-old. You don't love me because I can't have my fifth dessert. <laughs> I can't do what I want. I can't go break that thing I, or break my sibling. You, you don't love me. So things that we're discontent about is appearance. Um... I remember, oh, no, I don't remember so long ago, maybe 40 years ago, I went to a Bill Gothard seminar, and uh, he starts out with, it's called, it was back then it was called the Institute in Basic Youth Conflicts, and he noticed that the problems that youth had carried over into adulthood. And one of the things he starts with is identity, and accepting your appearance as being fearfully and wonderfully made according to God's purposes, not according to the airbrushed, uh, I forget what the name of the program is that does the photoshopped uh, Instagram pictures you see, <clears throat> our health. Uh, so many of God's choice servants uh, did not have great health. Most of them had horrible, from the human standpoint, finances, but God supplied all their need. Uh, we are discontent about you know, finances mainly because we want the security that comes from them as opposed to trusting God. Same with possessions. Possessions give us status. They can make life easier, but you have too many of these things that make life easier, they actually make life harder because you've got to put them somewhere to take care of them. Uh, oh, yeah, discontent about our job. Yeah. We were happy to get it, right? <laughs> when we didn't have it. Now that we have it, we want a new one. And uh, unfortunately, I've seen more people than I'd care to remember jump out of the frying pan into the fire. They left in pursuit of a better job because they didn't like their job, they didn't like their boss, they didn't like their coworkers, they didn't like the way their bonus was, they didn't like this, they didn't like that. But did they stop and think God gave them that? And he had a purpose for it and provide help for it. Don't like our housing, don't like being singleness. singleness. I got a great sermon. Actually, the title's great. You can listen to it. It's called The Lord of the Ringless. And I did it back in Lord of the Rings thing, and uh, I, I think it's pretty decent. Content, discontent with our spouse, yeah, it's like it, 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 
no spouse is perfect. There's always things you could find fault with. Same with goes for family. Uh, the amount of freedom that we have. If you're uh, in your teens and you think that, oh, I'm being so restricted, my parents are so strict, uh, count that as a blessing. And that survey I went through, uh, they also included of the various groups of people when they broke them into categories, uh, the ones who had the closest super supervision, the most stable home life, uh, the uh, ones who, you know, basically we would say, oh, that was so terrible. Uh, the category, Asians. 89% uh, of them had the closest supervision. And like on some of the problem things, there were only 2% of them that had the problems. Uh, responsibilities. Um, I had to start paying for my rent um, and my tuition when I was 15 or 16. Uh, yet I was taught responsibility. It took me 10 years or so to learn it. Uh, the, my needs aren't met, my desires aren't met, uh, but those can all be met with contentment if we get the right perspective. In essence, we don't have what we think we need we, 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 to be worthy, to be happy, and we don't have it when we want it, and we don't have any hope of getting it soon, so let's just get this despair, let's despair, or find some way of escape from this painful realization. Instead of that, you need to pray. Be still, and know that I am God. This is the God we serve, the God who is within us, who put his spirit within us, the willing to do his good pleasure. We need to be still and meditate on that. He is our good shepherd. He has led us to green pastures. But being led by God sometimes means you go through the valley of the shadow of death. But you don't have to fear any evil. Why not? Because thou art with me. But here in this Psalm 46, he's going to be exalted among the nations and in the earth and in your life. He is the creator. I remember hearing something when I got around the navigators. Lila Trotman, Dawson Trotman's wife, so a sailor who was kind of downcast, and she said, young man, if God doesn't have what you need, he can make it. And he can. But he always gives what's best when it's best. And apparently, God had some lessons for that young man to learn. <clears throat> God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. When we put ourselves in God's place, we are being proud, just like Satan. So God's going to resist us. And if we get what we want, he'll send leanness to our souls, or Satan is giving it to us, and we've sold our soul to Satan. A couple of really popular singers have basically, well, by their very own words, said they, you know, preacher's daughters sold their soul to Satan. Uh, by their lifestyle, it's the same thing. So many of them grew up in church choirs. We should get rid of choirs. Okay, because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble, humble yourself. Put yourself down, recognizing your unworthiness, that he may exalt you in due time. Tell him, and then leave all your cares with him. He cares for you, and he knows what's best. Are you good sheep or rebellious sheep? I mean, you know, it's like most, most of us are always wondering for the next you know, pasture. Be aware of reality instead of escaping. Be on your guard instead of cringing. Because your adversary, the devil, is walking around seeking whom he may devour. And he munches on particularly carnal Christians um, until they start doing his will and then he leaves them alone. There are a bunch more things, but let's look for good things to be discontent about. As far, I, I have hardly ever maybe a couple people a couple times I've heard them actually be, be discontent about their spiritual growth what was, what, what's your thinking of your spiritual growth every year I encourage people to evaluate themselves and uh, in toil I split up biblical commands into five objectives you should have because God commands us to do things that relate to our, our work and career our relationships personal growth physical growth and spiritual growth and ministry and uh yeah, and I encourage people to put like an equal amount of time, an hour or so each day, into each one of those categories, or two hours, or you know, depending on how the time goes. Um, 
How much time and effort do you put into your spiritual growth? How much time and effort do you put into your ministry where you are teaching people to obey? You're introducing them to the Savior, and you're teaching them to obey God's commands. That means you have to get them into the scriptures. How equipped are you? Have you equipped yourselves for ministry? Most, you know, Only 2% of the people have read through the entire Bible, which is why I wrote Daily Truth Base. But you know, less a fraction of a percent have actually led someone to Christ, much less discipled them. Um, are you, how content are you with your knowledge of God and His Word, folks? Daily Truth Base solves this. It will. It's you know, you, a condensed uh, four years of first-rate theological education into something you can actually get through in a year, twice to get through it. Um, maybe it takes an hour every day. Could take you two. Uh, are you discontent about your ministry to others? Have you ever got to the point where you're pleading for God to use you in the lives of others? Uh, and being an injustice. Um, human trafficking just, you know, really is is so evil. Um, there's good things to be uh, discontent about with that. And the discontent is, can be expressed first in prayer and then seeing what action God might want you to take. So, where do these sources of discontentment come from? Satan. It's his system. The world, the flesh, the devil. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that's your worth and value issues, does not come from the Father, but is of Satan's world. He has set up this world, and uh, we just happily crawl through it, um, taking our eyes off God and onto the temporal things. Even the garden. Learn that lesson. If our eyes aren't fixed on trusting and obeying God, even in a perfect environment, we will be discontent. I mean, what did Eve have to be discontent about? I mean, she didn't have the pictures in Vanity Fair or Vogue or anything to be discontent about. I don't think she didn't even have clothes, so she was, you know, had clothed with glory, and there's nothing better than a glory suit. Um, so all her needs were met. She was married to the perfect man who shirked his responsibility, and let her bake an apple pie, and ate it. Satan tempts people today. He's not omniscient, but he has a third of all the angels that are numerous, which you can't number them, uh, to do, you know, to, uh, uh, to pull us off the right path. You've all seen <coughs> little cartoons of a you know, good angel and bad angel on each shoulder. Um, we have a guardian angel, and we have Satan's demons, and uh, there's a spiritual world that we are just, for the most part, woefully uh, unaware of. But basically, stuff in the temporal, we want that more than we want God, we are doing Satan's bidding. And he takes Christians captive to do his will. Don't deceive yourself. Uh, end of First Timothy 2, 24 or so. Makes that really clear, people in a church. And I've known many of them. Source of discontentment, unsanctified and unexamined values. You grew up with a set of worldly values, which you got from the world around you, from your education. Oh my goodness, now. You know, it's, it's, education is just totally detrimental to your both physical health and your spiritual health. Um, unsanctified and unexamined. You don't examine what you value in light of the scriptures, and you don't make them holy. Now, Contentment, being just content with your lot, is pretty good, but you need to have godliness. That means knowing and doing all that God requires. That was the description of what happened even in the pagan religions when the priests were the godly ones because they knew and did what the God re God's required. Uh, we tend to know what God wants and eh, let someone else do it. But knowing it and doing it, great gain. And then he actually makes it clear that, you know, we've brought nothing into this world and it's certain we're going to carry nothing out. So, having food and clothing, with these, be content. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your lust or desires for pleasure that are at war in your body? You lust and you don't have. You murder and you covet, but you can't obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Okay, God, give me this. Oh, verse 3. 
you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss that you amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Because whatever we're supposed to do, we're supposed to do for the glory of God. He created us for our glory. He created us, made us for this very purpose to be able to get an inheritance in the future. God has made us for this very purpose. This verse on it somewhere. Maybe it's First Peter two. I don't sure. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with what you have, for he himself said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Let's apply this. Do you really have, are you really aware of, and do you value the presence of Emmanuel, God with us? You know, we a real happy Easter, yay, rose from the dead. And now it puts a spirit within us. Most people aren't aware of that. They're not guided by God's spirit. They're not guided by God's word with the spirit of truth wrote. Um, they don't value the presence of God more than um, a golf game, uh, a quiet time, I mean a video game over a quiet time. Yeah, we, we, just, we just don't value it. And as a result, we reap discontent, uh, we reap alienation from God, your sins cause a separation between you and God, so he doesn't hear your prayers. Satan hears them and will try to fulfill them so you'll keep away from God. Okay, I think it was a title of a book like this way back when, when I first did this. How to have what you want and want what you have. And I think uh, there's another book like that. It's called The Bible. <laughs> uh, it tells you how to have what you want, pray, and uh, seek and knock, and how to want what you have, be content. All right. So... <laughs> little phrase that I'm going to elaborate upon here. You want to change for the best because if you're discontent, you need to change your thinking, your values, your actions. And then trust God for the stuff that you can't change. Change for the best, trust God for the rest. Contentment is found in submitting your present biblical path as God's, or submitting to it, as God's perfect will. When I went through it this time, I realized, oops, I better put biblical in there. So, the scriptures tell you what the path is. They're given by God, according to 1 Timothy 3, 16, inspired. Uh, they're profitable for teaching what the path is. Correction, I mean, uh, reproof, showing you when you're off the path. Correction, showing you how to get back on the path. And training in righteousness, showing you how to keep on the path, have endurance, have resilience for when you fall off. So, if we have gotten into, this is particularly true of jobs, definitely true of marriage, um, true of a lot of relationships that you don't like, God has put you in them for your benefit, to learn something. Uh, how many of you have sandpaper people at work? People that are just difficult. Nobody likes them. Well, that doesn't give you the excuse to not like them either. Um, consider, like, why are they like they are? Yeah, they're damaged. Yeah, same with those relatives. You know? They're all damaged. We're damaged. You're damaged. Uh, God is working on making you whole. And uh, you should work on loving your neighbor as yourself. Uh, but then Jesus did tell the disciples, if they don't want to hear you, just shake the dust off your feet as a sign of judgment that when God comes to judge, you don't want any part of them clinging to you. And then... See where God else God wants you to. But for the most part, he wants us to stay at the place to learn contentment before we move on. Um, so, we submit, we get grace. Submit to God. Otherwise, we get the devil. You can't resist this most supernatural force on earth without the supernatural force of heaven. Uh, when the devil sees that, particularly through the word, he'll flee from you. We Then, okay, you draw near to God. Some of us are just like, have a non-aggression pact with Satan. You know, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. But what about a relationship with God? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I, mean, I love this passage. We have to take the initiative. It's not the hound of heaven who's going to you know, chase us down and you know, hold us until we... You know, submit. Um, he lets us go our own way. And then, and you're drawing near to God, you're going to find out that, you know, you, you're kind of stinky. So you need to clean up your act. 
cleanse your hands, you sinners, that we'd stop doing the things that are separating you from God. And then, this is the part that gets so missed. Purify your hearts. Purify your desires. You're double-minded. You're not going to receive anything from the Lord. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be unsatisfied with life. Uh, you're not going to get blessed here nor in the future uh, unless you have the mind of Christ. The word, the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to produce in us the mind of Christ. Sanctification in a nutshell. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God to produce in us the mind of Christ. If the Word of God isn't the thing that is flowing through your thinking and heart, you don't have the mind of Christ. And in this piece, some of you have heard me say this before, lament and warm and mourn and weep, let your laughter return to mourning and your joy to gloom. This used to be my favorite birthday verse for my kids, friends to send to them. <laughs> um, but in recent years, I realized, yeah, when you realize how uh, stubborn, stupid, ignorant, ungodly, and offensive to God that you've been with have pursuing the wrong values, you should lament those years when decades that you have spent grieving him. He was grieved that he made mankind. Uh, and we're told, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh, people in Acts 9 were told, you always resist the Holy Spirit just like your fathers did in the Old Testament. Um, we grieve him. We should grieve over the fact that we have grieved him when we really have changed our mind and repented. Uh, the things that you used to enjoy should be things that you wish regret and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. The imagery here is you fall on your face in the dirt because that's how low you are. And then he will lift you up. So most of you know Romans 12, too, says God has a good, acceptable, and perfect will. But in order to achieve that, we have to first Romans 12, 1, and then Romans 2, A. Romans 12, 2, A. Uh, we need to yield ourselves, present ourselves to God as a living, ongoing, daily sacrifice. Like, take up our cross daily and follow him kind of sacrifice. Then, we have to refuse to be conformed to this world. I find it really interesting and intriguing that we are told to do that, and there's not the mention of having the Spirit of God help us do that. It, it's something that we are capable of doing, but I guess when we're not, we need to depend on Him, like the 12-step method. And then you are metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind. You've got to renew your mind. You've got to purify your heart. Same thing there. Um, to experience His good, acceptable, perfect will. So since His will is perfect, and we're not happy, then we are resisting and missing His perfect will through our prideful independence or sin. It's that simple. Lack discontent over our circumstances, um, that act, particularly stuff that causes us to distance ourselves from God, is pure and simple demonic sin. Or, you want to get to the sins of Lucifer, we think we know better than God about the means and time of the fulfillment of his promises. God, I want to be married by this time, or I want to have this job, and I want to make this amount of money, and I want to blah, 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 blah. I want, I want, I want, I want. It's kind of like Satan, I will, I will, I will, I will. Um, so we can change that, people. We can change to experience the good, acceptable, and perfect will if we would just follow James 4 and Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's not just two passages, two simple you know, scriptures. You just can you know, understand them, study them, apply them. I might have a few more comments on Daily Truth Base, but they're, they're, all you really need is right there in the scriptures. Um, okay, we might need to change to what God wants us to do to get on the right path. Let's change for the best. Here's our Romans 12. Boom. And then 
we need to draw on God's grace to prayerfully change, thankfully wait, and joyfully endure. Uh, Psalm 8411 should show up on the next screen, but um, no good thing will he withhold from them and walk uprightly. So you can determine and get yourself in a place of blessing, which is a whole series we just did earlier this year, by making sure you are walking uprightly, not bowed down by the storms that God has allowed to come your way. And the reason you can thankfully wait for the fulfillment of God's promises is because His presence really should be all we want. But, you know, if you're like me, you don't want just his presence. Uh, you want some other things. But if it comes to his presence or presence of others, I'll just take his presence, please. Thank you. So Paul prayed, Lord, take this from me. Jesus said, sorry, Paul. Uh, I, I got a really important lesson for you to learn here that is going to benefit people for you know hundreds of generations. My grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in your weakness and my strength is the stuff that is supposed to be brought to perfection because it's my glory being revealed and that is why I created you. Paul knew that so he could say, I'm almost gladly, I'll boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. The power of Christ is resting upon you in this life, the glory of Christ will rest upon you in the next life. And that's how you can rejoice in the Lord always, not in what he gives you, Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And Paul has to say it again because he knows we just don't want to buy this. Rejoice. Getting close to the end here. Um, knowing God's is the key to commitment. Knowing God, his character, what he's like and what he's promised, which we only get out of his word, we can imperfectly get it from his dealings in our lives, but we usually have trouble um, mailing it accurately. It's really the key to commitment. And when he's your all in all, we sing that. You are my all in all. If we really believe that, we'd be content. Here's what you need to know about God. He is sovereignly and wisely in control. All right? He has arranged all my circumstances for my best benefit and his glory. God works all things together for good, right down here, to those who love God. Okay, do you love God? Hmm, do you love him more than yourself? Do you love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Or you just give him lip service? To those who are the called according to his purpose. Um, it's a much better translation. The called are the choice ones. And God will work those things together. And that's you're called to bless and rule. So calling has two meanings here. One is summoning and one is choice. And uh, both meanings can work in here. Second thing is the verse out of Jeremiah. Ah, oh, Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There's nothing too hard for you. Yeah, like where is the God of Elijah? Um, you know, we, we live with such a paltry splinter of God's power in our lives. Um, but he is seeking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect to him. So we can walk uprightly and work on having a heart that's perfect in his sight. And uh, then we might see him do more things. The other thing to know about God is he is infinitely good and loving, all right? His goodness is infinite. His love of us is infinite. He always wants what best for us. So that's what love is. You desire what's in another's best interest. And it is surely better to experience a little difficulty here on earth to get a, lots of glory in the future that goes on forever. Our life on this planet actually is short. Our life in eternity is longer than we can really comprehend. So, God will give me what's best, when it's best, and that is when I'm ready for it. Often we want things that are God's will, 
but we want them right away. Just like Eve wanted the stuff that God had given her desires for. And God had a plan to give her the eternal glory. But she took Satan's shortcut, and we do that as well. So those people, in the, and I mentioned in the beginning, the, the teens, the class of 2021, um, I, I really feel for them. Because they don't go to church, and even if they did go to church, they wouldn't be hearing God's word. They're hearing things that are band-aids. Um, not the fact that you know God is not going to dwell uh, under a band-aid. He wants to be on the throne of your life. So you're ready for it when you're humbled and committed to him. Lord God is a sun and a shield. He gives grace and glory. He protects you, the shield. He gives you warmth, glory, grace. No good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. No good thing will he withhold. If it was good for us, if it was his will for us, if it was best for us, he'd give it. So why hasn't he given it? Because it's not best for us now. Why not? Because we're not ready for it. What do we have to do to get ready for it? Let's work on getting our heart perfect. Let's make sure our life is aligned with his will. And we have given up all our small ambitions. What's a small ambition? Everything except God's eternal uh, blessings. God gives all sufficient grace as well as perfect gifts. He will give me grace to profitably wait for the fulfillment of what is best. He will give me power. Grace is power. It can also be desire. Philippians 2.13, God works on us to will and to do his good pleasure, to desire and do his good pleasure. It's grace that he's giving us. And waiting is not just, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. We can profitably wait, be busy growing, developing character, developing trust in God. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, so there's no variation or shadow of turning. The good and perfect gifts are all from above, not from this world. Even if you come in little Tiffany boxes. Diamonds are not forever, by the way. I think they melt. Um, and then I actually added this one. It's the last one. God has wonderfully and purposely created each of us for his glory. You believe you are fearfully and wonderfully made? You are. But why? To do the good works that glorify him, which the scriptures tell us about. It's Ephesians 2, 2 Timothy 3, 16, Matthew 5, 16, all in there. So he created us for our glory. And he has sovereignly allowed the events, including mistakes, in our lives. Not his mistakes, our mistakes. Um, I spent multiple years between high school and finally graduating from college uh, making mistakes. But God overrode those mistakes. He built things into my life through those mistakes. He moved me from my you know, ambitions uh, and then and desires, and then fulfilled my desires, and then I saw that, you know, it's not all it's cracked up to be. Um, I've told the story before, but when I graduated from college, I had this, you know, phenomenal job um, offer, and uh, I was also had an offer to learn how to better make disciples, and by God's grace, I turned down the phenomenal job offer to um, pursue uh, learning how to make disciples. Uh, when I was in college, I had opened up a restaurant in the United States and a hotel in Zermatt, Switzerland. And I just really love opening stuff. It, you know, it's a challenge, it's creative, it calls on you know so much of my abilities and talents. and 
I thought it was great. So um, after I went up there, I found out I, I couldn't get a job washing pots in a fraternity. Um, you know, I was graduated with honors from the hotel school uh, after you know switching from other schools within Cornell, and uh, I basically lesson I learned as God humbled me is he'll supply my needs. People walked up to me and gave me envelopes that had just the amount I needed for rent. Um, and then um, I got a job opening up restaurants. Over a dozen of them in less than a year and a half. And uh, you open them up, you get them running, you get them profitable, you turn them over to an idiot who runs them into the ground because uh, the, your higher-ups are some of the funding people want to get more money out of the thing. And I realized, okay, I've done that. It, it just it doesn't satisfy. And then um, I never wanted to go back to grad school when I finished. I am done with this. But God kind of miraculously got me into seminary. Um, you know, like a month before it started. You're supposed to apply a year before it starts. Um, taught me so much there. Um, not just academics, but through... You know, seeing godly guys, uh, the professors, a couple students, but for the most part, some of the professors. And then uh, he fulfilled my desires um, and you know, was able to make disciples. Uh, I love studying and teaching God's word. Um, it's, you know, one, one of my favorite things to do. I actually like studying it more than I like teaching it. But, you know, it's a yob. Anyway, um, he's take, taken our events and mistakes. He's worked them together for his good and glory. All we have to do is follow a song I learned with Campus Crusade. Trust and obey and follow his perfect will and priorities for our lives. And he can live contentedly, ever, happily ever after. Uh, discontent now is going to be uh, fulfilled properly in the future if we respond properly now. I got some questions here. Uh, I'm not at time, but uh, you need to go through these. Why are we most attempted to be content about what are we most and why? Uh, does getting what we want satisfy? How can we not become like Golem? That's a little guy down here. Poor guy. He was a hobbit. Hobbits are normally happy, nice fellows. But because he wanted the ring and it's lost it and spent his life looking for it and killed people for it, he just became less and less, for lack of a better word, human or hobbits-like, and became this this shadow of creation, a, a ghoul almost. Uh, lots of people are like that. If we're not finding our satisfaction in a relationship with an incomparable God, why do we think that addiction to finite, vain trash will satisfy? The thing that you're choosing over the incomparable God is finite, it's not going to last, vain, it's empty, it's just garbage. Of course, you do it to the glory of God in working with it, but it's not your life. You, you know, you, almost every company is not going to treat you like you deserve. So people keep trying to change jobs. Why do we doubt that God knows what he's doing, desires are best, and will work all things together for our highest good? Because we're not in a position to be blessed. There's a series on what you have to do to get you know, be, be blessable. So this is a good follow-up to that, and you, if you haven't heard that, you go back to it. Uh, what does God want you to do in the area in which you are discontent? What strength does he provide? What do you need to do it? And how are anxiety and discontentment uh, related? Uh, be content. You need to be content so you can draw on God's power for ministry. So those people that are in the survey, that whole generation, um, they're lonely. It's another huge thing. Uh, there's hope for the generation because their use of escapism in various forms has gone down. Uh, they need to have hope and trust in uh, the God of the Bible and his promises. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you made us to find our rest in you and be discontent with actually other things on this earth. Satan will try to distract us from the purpose that for which you created us. Uh, we confess that we are often allured by his trinkets, 
and led astray by uh, his, his uh, bait. So give us uh, discernment and wisdom to see things for what they really are. Give us the humility to acknowledge that we have sinned and are sinning uh, when we seek our will over your will. Be like Jesus, help us, uh, not my will, but thine be done. And we look forward to uh, what you will do in terms of changing us so that we can receive all that you have for us in Christ's name. Amen.